Um, I was getting better at coming into a new studio, new director, new puppets, and getting to know um, how do these puppets work? What does the director like? What does the director not like? Um, getting to know the other animators a bit more. And then I'd be out of work again for a month or two months. And it was around this time I did a bit of teaching too. Back at the university I was studied at. Um, oh, wow. Uh, part, partly, obviously, to pay the bills and keep myself employed. Um, uh, but Fireman Sam here was a really special one because this hired, I got hired on for 18 months on this. I was the assistant animator to begin with. Goodness, I remember using, I stuck a, um, a, 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 a paint stick, or what's the word? A brush, a paintbrush, that's the word I'm after. Um, under here, underneath, to sort of jam the mud up to make the mud animate. Uh -huh. I'll play it in a second. Um, and Fireman Sam, there was lots of special effects and lots of water, lots of working with post-production about the fire and the smoke, lots of daring rescues and lots of quirky characters. So I had, um, I learned a lot on this. 18 months of practice every day. So Tim, were you working on multiple, uh, like were you playing multiple roles or you were, were you only animating the puppets? Like you said, you use the paintbrush for certain things. So were you also creating the set or working on the SFX later on? And... No, I was only an animator at this stage. And okay. I, had, I had learned early in my career that um, I couldn't try and be a model maker, director and animator. I, I it should try and focus on one thing. Um, I, I can give you different philosophies on that. I, if you're a very small company working with two or three people, yes, you're going to be doing much more multitasking. But the bigger the project, the more you're doing um, one role. And, and I needed time to focus and get better at um, right. animation. I'll, I'll play you a sequence from Fireman Sam because um, bear in mind I was getting better and better at turning up getting to know different puppets, getting to know a different director. And you'd mentioned that once you animate water in a yeah. stop motion project, exactly. you know, nothing can be... You, I'll show you those two shots because, um, um, you know, I was a young animator still and um, it's, I wasn't sure how to do a walk yet. Um, I was pretending I could do a walk and hoping no one noticed that I didn't know. <laughs> and then when you're asked to do stuff like this, mud, um, there you go, 2004, this one, um, I didn't know how to do this, but here, here is the mud. Um, I didn't want to touch any of this area, so I was sticking a paintbrush underneath, so I could almost lever it up from underneath, if you will. Oh. Um, and I didn't have much experience with things like plasticine when I did that either. Um, now, I'm going to show this Norman drowning sequence, because when I was at Fireman Sam, they, they, they had a sequence with quite a bit of water in, but nothing like this. And they, we said to S4C, or the producers did, can we please never show, do lots of water again? And they came up with this sequence. And here's some clip. I'll, I'll play a clip copy. Oh, wow. I looked at that on the storyboard on the wall and thought, oh my God, who is going to get that? Whoever gets that, that's an absolute nightmare. Yeah. And of course, who gets it? Yes, I get it. So I'm going to play a little clip. Oh, you can see here, just so to explain what it is, it's a massive sheet of perspex. Um, and lots. Of, we cut a hole around Norman. And uh, there's a hole around here that he could be moved up and down on a scissor jack, a little riser. And then I'm animating loads wow. and loads of different layers of cling film. So I have a lot of practice. He's water. spitting out water as well. <laughs> yes, he is. I'll play a little bit and we'll go from there. Point, I'm getting much better at water. This is probably the best shot in the water effects. But God, I was getting bored. <laughs> That's a lot of cling film to have to move. And I was doing about three seconds a day, not the 10 seconds a day they wanted. I'll, I'll play <laughs> a bit 
I'll play a bit more because you see it gets even yes, s- yes, please. sillier in a second. Island! <laughs> Yes, we see him, James. In break the pontoon, then. Great you are. Now, a little bit behind here. Just when I thought it had got really difficult, they're going to inflate a pontoon over the water, which, because the line is, oh, it's like a bouncy castle, it's got to bounce up and down like a bouncy castle on water. Now, can you imagine for a young animator who's really chuffed he's getting opportunities but how intimidating can you animate a bouncy castle on the water with someone walking in it um yeah it was it was intimidating but i you just got to get on with it I've just seen there's a question from uh, Sujana about um, details of behind the scene of water. Um, as you can see, I had quite a bit of practice, and um, it's not the last time I've done quite a lot of water. But um, I'll find a really bad shot. I think the worst shot is this one to give you an idea. Well, Let's see if I can see it here. There's lots of different, there are two layers of cling film. There's a much fatter layer, which, and then they're not stuck down. I can just pull them slowly. If you look carefully, you might notice some shapes that get pulled along. And I learned with this to have a second layer. There's almost two layers of water and the layer on top is lying not very flat. It's got lots of air under it. And frankly, you, you just can't see where one bit of cling film finishes and the next one begins. Uh, I think there, that's getting a bit more noticeable as a, a cling film shape. Um, and cut them with scissors. Don't, don't tear them with your fingers because that leaves a real white line at the edge. Yeah, right. that, that's an ugly shape. Um, and Tim, was there any assistance in terms of technology? Were you able to view it frame by frame and, you know, how... Yeah. You know, what, what are the kind of tools you were using? Good question. Back. Um, yeah, uh, we, we had a software called Animate back then, which was hardware and software combined. So I was able to see the frames as I went. It was recorded straight onto video, not film. Um, here's a really bad shot. I was trying to use less water and you might notice some of the cling film shapes a bit more easily. It looks like a frozen lake here. So this is the worst shot in the whole yeah. thing. Um, Okay, I'll stop screen sharing. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I must admit, I'm, I've kind of just missed the generation where it was shot on film and you had no video assist and shot blind. Um, I, my student films, we had Umatic and Betacam tape. So I had a jog shuttle thing and you saw that huge remote control. Um, and then Animate was sort of starting around the time I was... 1999 is when I started professionally animating. Uh, so long before Dragon Print, I have I have shot on film before, but we normally had a thing called a lunchbox, right, right, which was right, a portable right. device. There might be some people nodding if they remember a lunchbox. Yes, lunchbox. Um, uh, so there was some basic video assist. So I've never properly had to shoot blind, and uh, that either makes me a bit of a fraud or that makes me far too young and youthful to be there in the film days, depending on <laughs> how you want to see it. Um, oh, uh, what I will say though about that sequence is that is quite a pivotal sequence in my career because that's one of those moments where, all right, it's a special effect, it's not character acting, but at that time I couldn't imagine doing anything as difficult as that. Right. 
but for a scene like that in the story the special effect is the main character you know that's what makes it uh, believable you know that entire sequence of of the panic and even when the pontoon you know the it's 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 inflated on the like it's it's rolled out and when the guy is you know walking uh, imbalanced and so all that it i think the water is the main character so yeah. i think that was a very well done you know it was a big challenge also for you like uh, like what Definitely. you were dreading you know it it came true <laughs> yeah cuz i mean sequences like that don't come along very often so on one hand it's um a bit of a privilege to be asked to do it on the other hand of course there's the responsibility and politically you're in danger because that took i was doing 3 seconds a day and we were near the end of the production and we were 10 seconds a day is quite small for a kids series um oh. which means it was you know quite high quality um but you know when you're doing 3 seconds a day the producer is not giving you the nicest looks in the world Right. <laughs> and there's a book when when we when we finished at the end of the day on final time we'd sign in and we'd sign out and the animators in the book would write how many seconds they've done <laughs> um and i i've always struggled with speed in the especially in the early parts of my career because i think i am very finicky and detailed and i like to double check things to get them right it's taken me years to get my the confidence that um that's that's absolutely fine i know it move on Um so back then I I was very self-conscious about trying to do a good job still. And when you're writing down, you know, you've got Anthony and Tom were doing 15 to 18 seconds a day. Austin was normally doing uh, 10 to 12 seconds a day and Tim writes down he's doing 3 seconds a day. Doesn't make you look very employable. <laughs> But Tim, don't you like when you're bidding for different shots uh Uh, and a, a style like this would be pretty limited when it comes to just body language or conversations but in this case hmm. there was a lot more happening which was taking up the time right yeah and and there of course there's a certain amount of forgetfulness on this and simon quinn the, the producer on fireman sam um uh he he uh, we've been friends for many years now he's gone on to do frank and weenie and isle of dogs as line producer and things and Uh, he gets it he, he he understands stop motion very well he ran the puppet factory for over 10 years making stop motion puppets so uh, as producers go he's very very clued on to stop motion and how it works right. however he still <laughs> has the political issue that he has to explain to the boss of the company or s or c our investors he's got to kind of try and explain why we're going so slowly um and what what you need as a production you need some shots that are much faster to do right because you know you've got someone like me who's just moving so slowly so there's sort of a he's sort of covering it up to the finances to brush it over but at the same time tim you know it's just a cartoon series <laughs> no one really cares just yeah, get on with it <laughs> doesn't have to be perfect <laughs> and and i that was a burden i really faced throughout at least the first decade of my career was i was meticulous i was detailed um i i really cared about what i was doing and getting it right and that, i'm not, i'm naturally like that so i there's a benefit that my the quality of my work was um going up and up and i really was learning and trying and experimenting with things i was reading richard williams animation survival kit again around that time and i was trying some of those things on fire and sam right, right. trying twos trying ones trying special effects i was hungry to learn and get better but right. i was never ever ever the fastest animator in the room and i sometimes that affects your employability and i was very self conscious that i was battling to be fast enough let's be honest i think i've always been battling with trying to be good enough or can i be better or i must be better Mm-hmm. um yeah which is there, were, so, there are there are a lot of queries coming in tony ji do you want to take up any questions now uh okay. yeah there was a, a query from uh, william uh let me just uh, add him to the spotlight there he is hello william uh, william wants to know that did you use any ball and socket rigs or wire rigs for the mid air shot of the ball thrown to norman hmm that's a very specific question about a specific shot that was 16 years ago Um <laughs> um I might have a photo I could dig it out 
Uh, I think it was wire. I felt, I remember it. Goodness, goodness. No one's ever asked me this. Um, right. I think there was two pins that was glued to some aluminium wire and it would stab into the ball. And the ball had the ability to be squashed and stretched a little bit. I forget what was inside it. So you could do a bit of bounce. Um, I, I can even remember feeling this and holding it now, oh, goodness. So it would have been aluminium wire. And back then, William, in um, the early noughties, I think we call it that nowadays, um, it wasn't so popular to use ball and socket rigs. Um, we were still coming out of the days of film and the habit was still, if possible, you'd use fishing wire to hold something um, because it, people seem to think that fishing wire was invisible, which obviously it's not. Um, and, but around that time on Fire and Sam, the post-production was getting, digital post-production was getting more and more commonplace and ball and socket rigs obviously are much more controllable. So if you could hide them, um, the animator can go faster and um, there's, there's not much difference painting out a ball and socket rig or painting out fishing wire. Uh, I did, by the way, though, William, learn a lot about um, post-production on Fireman Sam, because the guy who was doing all the fire and the smoke in, um, he was doing it in, um, uh, the fire and smoke was computer animation, the water was stop motion. And um, so he was a mate of mine from uni. So I could just pop into the room and he could come and look at my shot and he could tell me if what I was doing was a real pain for post-production or whether that was easy for him, or we'd have something on fire and I'd have a little torch that would follow the hand around to make it look like there was a light on the hand mm. and he'd have the fire later. And he'd also adjust the fire so that it would be pulled by my hand. So we'd actually work oh. together quite closely, me and the post-production guy, and we'd learn loads. Um, well, I, I, I learned really? anyway about how post-production works. 